Good evening, and welcome to our Bible study. I'm Pastor A.D., Pastor of True Vine, NBC, here in Houston, Texas. Now, thank you so much for joining us once again. And today, we're in our last chapter of the Book of Romans, the Pauline Epistles, and it is the 16th chapter, the 16th chapter of Romans, and the title is True Love for the Saints, True Love for the Saints. And so, we're going to uh, really get deep into um, the scripture today we'll do verses 1 through 16 and then we'll pick it up next week um, on next Wednesday and finish it out but uh, it's been such a enjoyment a pleasure um, just teaching and learning myself about Apostle Paul and his adventures in Rome and um, and talk about Romans and what happened with the Roman church and it's just been an amazing experience and before I get started, I guess I'll pray and then we'll jump right into the message. And I have the overview and then we'll go verse by verse. Thank you so much again for joining us. Lord, thank you so much to God for letting us see another day, Lord. We thank you to God for bringing us to God into Bible study that we may learn and hear about your word to God. Help us, Holy Ghost to um, learn your scriptures, to learn more about what was going on then and what's going, what we need to do now and how we need to structure our lives accordingly, according to your grace and your mercy, according to God and how we should walk like Christ and how we should talk like Christ and teach us to God to be more like you. We love you so much and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And so, of course, I have my overview. And so we'll start with the overview, give you a background of what's going on within this chapter. And then we'll go uh, to verse one and we will go verse by verse. So as we begin this chapter, I just kind of want to draw your attention to the fact that it is very likely a chapter that you have never studied. It may be a chapter that you can't even remember reading because as soon as you started started it and saw all those names, you just skipped all over the chapter, just skipped all over the scripture. It's like, oh no, I don't know those names. I'm not gonna pronounce them or nothing like that. So it's not one of those most favorite chapters of those who preach and teach the word of God. And yet in many ways, it ought to be, it should be. It is sad that uh, it's neglected by many, in fact, by most Christian teachers because it is uh, by far the most extensive, um, the most intimate and the most specific of all the words of personal loving greeting ever to come from the inspired heart and mind of Apostle Paul. It's a rich and, thr and thrilling chapter. Now we begin this chapter with the name and name is the name of a lady, Phoebe. Uh, in the, some ways, I suppose the names in a chapter are incidental because we don't know these people. And for the most part, we don't even know who they are. Um, Phoebe we have a little information about her. Um, some of them we have absolutely no information about. The names are the somewhat incidental, if interesting, and still incidental. The real insight is that I want you to see here is the character of Paul's love and the networking of loving relationships within the ministry, within the church, and how it is possible to have that network within the church. This chapter provides for us one of the clearest insights into the community of the believing people in the early church and how the community function together. And we'll see that as we go through it. Now, let's look then back at the commendation in verse one and two, the master, masterful letter, the epistle to the Romans when completed was taken to Rome by a very special Christian lady by the name of Phoebe. And that is why Paul commends her to them. There is little doubt in the mind of those who study the epistle that she is the one carrying the Roman epistle to the church at Rome. Now, remember, Paul is writing to Corinth. In Corinth, I mean, he's writing in Corinth, and Corinth is in what we know now as Greece, modern-day Greece. Rome is what we know now, of course, as Italy, and that is significant. That is a significant journey, and this great epistle would be carried as a very delicate and a very valuable message to the church in Rome. There was uh, no x rocks machine or x rocks machine uh in, in that day, no fax machine, nothing like that, no um, email and then like so. Phoebe is the one given this sacred trust, this task to handle the word of God and to reach the destination of Rome and give it to the redeemed saints there in the church. This uh, special lady in arriving on Rome will give the letter and they will, as they look at, at it, note that in the beginning of the 16th chapter, she is commended to them as one worthy of their hospitality worthy of their care, worthy of their fellowship. And so at that very beginning, we sense the commendation of Paul and the expression of love toward this faithful Christian lady to whom 
he entrusted this great epistle to, of Rome. And on the epistle, do, and, and on that epistle, did not only hinge his plans. He wanted them to read about his desire to come to them and to find the resources to go to Spain. And but the altercation of the great truth of justification by grace through what uh, faith. And so to a lady that he trusted greatly, a lady that he loved in Christ greatly, he gives his wonderful ministry. Okay, so this articulation that he gives is amazing. And um, he lets them know, please receive this lady. So let's look at it at verse one. He said, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, which who is a servant in, of the church in Censoria. So <clears throat> it basically means to introduce. Only it's a richer word than that. It's, it, it, it isn't just to introduce, okay? It, it's in a casual way, but to introduce with the affirming statement of commendation. Now, this is a very common thing in the early church. Letters of commendation were written that was a well-worn custom in Paul's day when a believer, for example, would be traveling to another city and would want to go and fellowship with another church. That believer could carry a, commend, a commending um, letter from the church to in their own hometown, which would ensure to that new congregation that this is indeed one of the children of God, a brother or sister to be beloved, to be loved and received with hospitality. And the reason for that was the need for a place to stay. In those days, inns were nothing short of brothels. They were places where there would be perhaps looting and stealing and, and et cetera. You can just imagine with your mind, they were not safe places. And, and as a Christian people, as Christian people, traveled around the Roman world, the letters of commendation allowed them to, re to be received with love into varying Christian communities and shown hospitality and care for whatever matters of business they needed to carry on. Much so, m many such letters, by the way, according to the archaeologists, have been found particularly in the Egypt, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, Egyptian desert sands that provided for us in the rubbish heaps, um, some inside into the character of those ancient letters of commendation. Now, Paul, in commending Phoebe to the church at Rome, expresses his love for her and his desire that she be properly treated. We talked about that a minute ago, and uh, which is an old word for helper. Uh, he has a loving commendation for this gracious woman. By the way, her name means bright and radiant. And perhaps that was true of her testimony. Now, notice, first of all, that she is commended because she is our sister. She is our sister in what? Christ. That is not to say our sister in a physical sense, but our sister in a spiritual sense, in Christ. She belongs to the family of God. She is your sister. She is my sister. She is a member of the body of Christ. She is united to all Christians in the common resurrection life of Christ. Secondly, he, he says she is not only our sister, but she is a servant of the church, which is in um, Centuria. Now, Paul is writing from Corinth and about nine miles away, eight or nine miles on uh, Saronic Gulf was a port city, really the seaport for Corinth known as um, Centuria. Any shipping that needed to be done in Corinth would, would be done at Centuria, okay, at the port. It's very likely that the church in Centuria was founded as a result of the ministry of the church of Corinth, the, ch the church spying, if you will, a daughter church in the seaport town. So it was founded by the church of Corinth, more than likely. <clears throat> Verse two, that you may receive her and the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has needed for you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and myself also. So we can use the word uh, sorcerer, sorcerer, uh, sorcerer, which is to say she has been a helper of many. OK, not of black magic or nothing like that, but a helper of many. The word actually means a benefactor. Now, when I say the word Patreon, uh, do you know what that means? Do you know what the Patreon is? If you ever read any of the ancient European history, you, you, you understand a, a patron. A patron was someone who financially supported someone else. Many artists uh, had Patreon. They would paint and they would do their sculpture and they would do whatever they needed to do. Just like we have Patreon on um, YouTube. Some people have Patreon, which you can go and support their channel, support different needs. And so that's what it was for. Apparently, apparently this woman had enough means to provide a uh, patronage 
for not only the Apostle Paul, but for others in the church. The term is prostastis, prostastis. And it's basically in the Jewish community came to refer to a wealthy supporter. So this dear woman was a wealthy supporter, no doubt, of the church of Caesarea. Um, it may well have met in her home. She may have been in the church, in that church, uh, what Lydia was to the church in Philippi. Okay, that's what she was to her church, what Lydia was to the church at Philippi. And she also offered some support in some way to the apostle himself. So here is a lady distinguished from those three reasons, for those three reasons. And because of her godly ministry, she is entrusted with the epistle to the Romans to her care on her journey to Rome. And she is commended by Paul. And look at verse two again, the church is told to receive her in the Lord as becoming saints. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means to accept her as one belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept her in the sense you accept him. And you remember the words of Jesus that whatever you do in the least of these, my children, you have done it unto me. Any one of us who is in Christ, when treated by any other one of us in a sense of receiving the treatment that Christ himself is receiving, she was no alien to spiritual intimacy. She was no alien to spiritual community. And she was to be received in the love bond of fellowship and union with Jesus Christ. Receive her in the Lord. And that's how we should receive people today. Receive her in the Lord. It was how we should, definitely should receive other saints, uh, believers in Christ. You should receive them in the Lord. And so verse 3, let's look at verse 3. Uh, and it says, Greet uh, Priscilla, Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Now, the names uh, Priscilla and Aquila, they were not apostles. They were not prophets, but they were his follow, follow, fellow workers, okay? They were tent makers also. They were tent makers. They were, they were um, preachers. They were a husband and wife team, and, and they dwelt with Paul. They loved Paul. They, they followed Paul wherever he went. And so you say, what were they? Well, they were tent makers. You go back to Acts 18, verse 3. Acts 18, verse 3. They had the same profession that Paul did. And when he went to Corinth, he went to the synagogue. You read that, read about it in the first part of the 18th chapter. If you read that chapter of Acts 18, you'll see. And he went to synagogue. And when he went into the synagogue, he met them. That's where, he, that's where they met. And they loved each other, loved at first sight. And they loved each other. And they dwelt with with each other from that point on. And the man said not just on the one side, but that he said in an area of their profession. So it would not be uncommon for Paul to take his seat with the tent makers and therefore strike up a acquaintance with this man named Aquila. And as a consequence, met his wife, whose name is actually Presca. That's her name, Presca. I know it's a Priscilla, but her name is Presca. Presquilla Pres 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 is a um, diminutive Diminutive form, which is used by Luke. Luke favors the diminutive forms on many names, whereas Paul favors the more classical. Luke is a doctor, okay? Formal forms. This is true uh, not only of Presca and Priscilla, but of Silas and Silvanius, okay? That tends to be a difference between Luke and Paul. Their writing were different, okay? You Different. You'll see uh, the difference between each writer, whoever wrote what books, the, how they write their writing style. Paul wrote more like a lawyer and that's how he wrote. And so they were tent makers. And like the apostle Paul, who just used his tent making to support his ministry, apparently Aquila and Priscilla used their tent making to support their own ministry of proclamation of the gospel as well. So they had that in common. They were both tent makers. They were both preachers. They loved Christ. They loved God. They loved people. They loved God's people. So they really had a lot in common. And it's also interesting that this is the couple that mentioned six times in the New Testament, three by Paul and three by Luke. And Paul's and Paul, as I said, always uses Presca and Luke always uses Priscilla, favoring that diminutive form. And in the six, it uses four of uh time four times, four of the times she is mentioned first. Now that's a little unusual that a woman would be mentioned before her husband in that ancient world, okay, during that time. Some say it has to do with the dominant um, personality. And we all know that there are couples where the woman dominates. And there are, really today, truly today, there are couples where the woman dominates. And in fact, in all couples, there are times when the women dominate. In some couples, there are just more of those times. And, and so some say, well, she just had... Uh, she just had the 
infusive personality, infusive personality, okay? She because she because of her nature of her personality, she was a dominant factor. And some feel she was a noble Roman and was a humble uh a humble Jewish tent maker and then his, this noble Roman Roman lady marries the humble uh, Jewish tent maker and so by virtue of nobility she is named first we don't know the answer it's just a matter of speculation so really not important but we don't know the answer really and so they were thrown out of Rome because of Claudius banished all the Jews from Rome so all of them was thrown out of Rome though Paul was a Roman citizen and a Jew <clears throat> verse 4 who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. <clears throat> and so now I want you to know, folks, that's loyalty. I mean, that is true loyalty. That's a sort of symbolic way of saying that they put their head on the chopping block for me. They went out of their way to put their lives on the line for me. I mean, they were willing to die to preserve me. They would have given their lives that I might carry on my ministry. Wow, what a loyalty. That is so much loyalty. That's true loyalty. It's hard to find friends friends like that today. They put their lives in danger for Paul's sake. They, um, there must have been some specific incident uh, we don't know about, but that that occurred, which the life of Paul was on the line and they stepped into the gap and were willing to die for his sake. He, of course, was delivered and was so they by God's mercy and grace. Paul is so thankful. And so in verse four, he says, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Why are they thankful? Because they are all the product of Paul's ministry. Right. And a dead Paul means uh, end of everything. And so Paul had to survive. It was so important. It was so important that it was vital that Paul had to survive. That he survived that, that way he can keep the churches going and he can continue to build these churches. Like Paul said, I do the planting. Apollo does the watering, but God gives the increase. And so it was very important that Paul do the planting. Very important. So very important. So that's a great devotion. Great devotion. Verse five. Likewise, greet the church that that is in their house. Now here they are in Rome and their house is open to the house, the house church. Oh, this is a, a, a magnanimous, uh, magnanimous couple. OK, this is this is a, a beautiful couple. One of this is a, a couple that you really want to model your marriage after because they loved God. They loved each other. They love God's people and they were very um, dedicated to God's ministry, building God's kingdom. And now um, you'll get the flow as we go through here. You'll find out that the church in Rome met in several places. The church in Rome was not always meeting in one place. They had no building. So they were meeting in varying homes. Okay, various homes. So uh, they were really a, a whole lot of flocks, a, a whole lot of home uh, Bible studies. And since the church could only come together in a public place, perhaps outdoors for maybe the Lord's table, they came together sometime to meet in Priscilla and Aquila's home and have church. And that was amazing. And so they met there and they would have great church. And, and they loved Paul so much they would have died for him. They loved him so much. Their loyalty was so true to Christ and so true to Paul and so tr true to God's church. And that's how much, I mean, they loved it. They loved him so much so much so he is the first fruits of asia until the uh, church of christ and um here in um in in verse five this says greet my beloved uh Ep Ep Epetinus, um who is the first fruits of achaia uh achaia i'm sorry achaia to christ group and and so we want to look at that look at that name um epe Epenitas, Epenitas, Epenitas. So he is the first fruits of Asia unto Christ, the first convert in Asia Minor, which is now modern day Turkey. Um, Asia Minor had the city of, of Ephesus and all the other cities mentioned in Revelations 2. Uh, Laodicea, Philadelphia, Smyrna, um, Sardis, Thyatara, per, uh, Pergamos. So um, Ephesus, so all these different churches in Asia Minor, seven churches of Revelations, chapter uh, two and three. The first convert in Asia was uh, Epineta, Ep Epinatus, Epinatus. And now he is in Rome, a part of the church of Rome, moved there for whatever reason. Um, he calls him and here you get to see the love of Paul, my well beloved. He loved him so much. The first convert of Asia Minor, he loved him so much. And at verse six, let's see, greet Mary who labored much for us. So let's stop. 
uh, the manuscript evidence indicates that the last word is you, not us. Greek Mary. Now, there are six women in the New Testament who have the name Mary, a very common name. This is one of the this is one known to Paul. We don't know who she is because she has bestowed much labor. The word is strong word. It means to labor to the point of weariness. It's the very familiar verb copia, copia or copia, copia or copia. And so in Greek, it means to that it means to work to sweat or to exhaustion. And I do that every day on the railroad, work to sweat and exhaustion. So and that's how we should be within the ministry of God, work to sweat and exhaustion. But you can't it's hard to find people like that today that's willing to work like that for Christ. And he says, greet her who bestowed much labor on you. Now, how did he know about her? How did he know that she had given much labor to the church at Rome? How did he know that? And well, the best idea is that Aquila and, and Priscilla, uh, who had come from Rome, would have informed Paul about her and this dear lady that had given so much labor um, to the church. And the idea of much labor expresses the fact that, that she probably had been an early part of church at Rome. And the uh, fact that, in the fact, it's um, in the past tense indicates that by now she may have been very old and, be, and, and her labor was much behind her. And that's why the scripture says you, um, I must work the, work the works of him that sent me while it is day, because when night cometh, no man can work. When night cometh, you can no longer work. When you get older in life, it's hard to work. And so it's good to work while you're young. Do what you can while you're young. And he commends with a loving greeting this woman who in the past rendered much labor to the establishing and developing of the church and the believers in Rome. And so she did much for the church. And uh, we know that she labored much extensively for the church. Verse 7, Greek, um, Andronicus and Janiah, uh, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. So um, Andronicus, Andronicus is a male name. Um, Junias come by, come, could, it could be a male or female. We don't know. We have no way to know that. So either this is two men or it's another couple like uh, Priscilla and Aquila. But he does specify for a reason why he wants to greet them. Look at them. Number one, they were kinsmen. You say, does that mean that they were Jews? Well, certainly it does. It means that they were Jews because Paul was a Jew. But I believe it means more than that because they uh, are. there are other Jews mentioned on the list. Now, no doubt, many of them who are not identified necessarily as a kinsman is my, it's my conviction that they were actually relatives of Paul. In verse 11, um, Herodin, Herodin is, is my kinsman. And in verse 21, he mentions Jason and, and, and Sassipater, um, my kinsman. And so he, mean, he seems to identify those who have some actual relationship to him in an earthly way. They, were, they are Jews and perhaps it's fair to say they were are related were or are related to Paul. So he wants to greet these who were related to him, who were in Christ. That must have been a wonderful thing for him to have, right? C coming out of a Jewish family, being a tribe of Benjamin, being a Hebrew of the Hebrews, to know that some in his family had embraced the same Christ that he had embraced as well. And so we get a little feel that his family may well, may well have been involved in the extension of his ministry. Secondly, he commends the greet and greets them in love because they are my fellow prisoners. Somewhere along the line, and we don't know where, Paul spent a lot of time in prison. Read 2 Corinthians 11 chapter verse 23. He says in prisons often. He was in prisons often and we know that he was in prisons often. We don't know where it was, but in one of the imprisonments or another, they were there also. Okay, They were there with him. They had paid the price imprisonment too for the faith in Christ, for the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he greets them who had shared prison with him. And I want you to know, my dear friends, that it wouldn't take much imagination to come to realize to realization of the fact that if you in that day and age spent time in prison with someone, you would get to know them very well, very, very intimately. And, and, and no doubt that had happened. And so there, there was a deep bound uh, intimacy and, and love for these people that he that he he um, spent the, the, uh, in prison with. And, and and I'm telling you, still delivering the gospel together in love. 
and um, support and um, just prayer and, and fasting and loving one another and building one another up with um, Antronicus and Junius. And so those were his fellow prisoners, his fellow relatives that he spent time with in prison. Verse 8, greet Amplius. Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greek, Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. So he mentions apply to us. That's what you'll read in the Greek, apply to us. My beloved in the Lord. And again, we see the word beloved for the second time. This is a loving man, as I've been saying. And he denotes and he demonstrates his love. And there is no fear of saying that. You know, some people find it hard to say, I love you. And some people do. Or to call someone a beloved friend, not Paul. He had no problem with that, with saying, I love this person. I love this man. I love this woman. Now, let me say a little about Implitus. Um, we don't know who he is, but let me give just give you some fascinating things to think about. We do know that this um, Epliotus is a slave name because in the history we can find it among the slaves and slave did not bear the name of free man or nobleman. So it is a slave name. In fact, it is a very common name in the imperial household of Rome. That is the household of Caesar. Uh, of, um, Caesar. And there is a cemetery of Domitia, Domitia the earliest of the Christian uh, cops. One of the most fascinating things I've ever done uh, to wonder and think about and look at it, and you really research it is the cops of Rome. There, uh, they were the burial place, the burial place of Rome. This is the place the oldest of those, the earliest of the cops is at Domitia. And so, in the earlier um, tombs, we look at is there a large name of Plotius? This this name is there. It is in large letters of Plotius, and which is quite interesting because single names were unique. A Roman nobleman or a Roman freeman would have three names, but a slave would only have one name. And a Plotius uh, was a slave. The fact that at the at his burial, if it be the same Plotius, he is given a large and rather decorated tomb, and his name is placed there for all to see. Indicates the comparison with the other burial places and uh, that he was set apart as a high ranking in the church, which is a wonderful insight because what it tells us is while the world may have ranked people according to their economic status, the church didn't do that. And a slave could rise in the church of Jesus Christ to a place of recognized prominence to be given unique honor in his burial. So it may well have been that in the church, in many cases, and in many places, slaves were actually the elders teaching their own owners the word of God. So that is amazing to know that. So Aplatius, but likely a slave. We don't know much about him, but likely a slave. Perhaps this one, perhaps another one. And then he calls him my beloved in the Lord. Great personal affection that Paul loves to show. Verse 9. <clears throat> Greek Urbanus. Urbanus, Greek Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Statius, Statius, my beloved. Okay, so now uh, Urbanus is a very common Roman name. It suggests that he's a native Roman, probably a Gentile. He calls himself our helper. Um, that is to say that he helped me and he helped the Roman church. I don't know how or where, but Paul knew and had been an assistance to, and he had been assisted to Paul at some point uh, as the Roman church. And he says, greet him. He say, hello for me. Give him my love. Tell him I am concerned. I mean, this is, this is the marvelous intimate, uh, marvelously intimate intimacy. And, and then he mentions statues, statues. Or statues, statues. That is a very unusual Greek name. It it means ear of corn, ear of corn. It could, it would be like naming your son Cobb, basically. Okay, naming. <laughs> it is a very strange name, even in the culture. He says, "Greek Cobb, my beloved." Statues, Cobb. <laughs> Again, he doesn't have any compunction about it, about expressing his deep love to his fellow believers that he dwelt with, that he labored with in the gospel. I don't know where he met him or how he, he, he met him, how he knew him. We don't know that. All we know is he did. He knew this guy. He knew these guys. And so that is amazing. And he loved him. Verse, uh, let's see, verse nine, statues, my beloved. Verse 10, Greek um, Apelles, 
approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Okay, so let's look at that. Aristobulus. Um, tried and proven true, tested, proven, trustworthy, a tried and tested and proven brother, faithful, and dependable, appellate, approved in Christ. Oh, what a commendation that is to have that said about you. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have that someone would mention that about you? Tried and proven and true. You've been tried. You've been tested. You've been thrown in the fire. You've been tested so many times. However, you are trustworthy. You are who you have been proven. Your loyalty is so amazing. It's so astounding. So worthy of, of confidence. We don't know anything about this person either. That's all we know. But boy, that's enough for someone to say that about you. Greet. He says, this is very interesting. Greet them who are of the household of Aristobulus uh, or literally in the text, greet those who are of Aristobulus. Now he doesn't greet uh, him. We assume that Aristobulus is, uh, is not a Christian, not a believer, not in the church, but some of his household. And, and the King James translators and authorized version did write putting in the household of because it's implied. Greet those who are of Aristobulus, um, those who belong to his household. If if he was a Christian, he would have greeted him too, but he's not a Christian. And so here we have the fact that the gospel has divided a family. It's a divided household. And it may have been his wife or his children or part of his servants or all of above. Uh, Aristobulus not being a believer, but in the in his household, there were believers. And we learned something else about the early church, that it is what uh, it that it was um, divisive. Uh, there was division uh, that Jesus said, I come to bring a sword to set apart against his father and a daughter against his mother and to divide a family. I came to do that. And that's what is talking about. Verse 11, greet Herodon, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Nasirius, Narcissus, um, Narcissus, 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 who are in the Lord. Okay. Here's a Jewish relative of Paul uh, who definitely has some relationship to the family of Herod. So it could be the Apelles in a form of Abel taking a, taken by a Jew who belonged also in the household of Aristobulus. Uh, who was a descendant of Herod the Great. And Herodon obviously would have had some connection to the family of Herod. So it's very possible that this household of Asterobalus was a group of people who actually came from Herod the Great. And though Asterobalus was not a believer at, the, at his death, that family had been absorbed into the imperial household and many of them had become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can perhaps speculate. We can't be certain, but we can speculate and wonder who this person is, they, that they were uh, within the very imperial household as growing congregation of those who love the Savior. What a wonderful thought. And so then verse 11, it mentions Herodon, who is related to Paul. Then he says another household, greet them that they are of the household of uh, Nasarsis. Nasisaurus, I'm sorry, excuse me, who are in the Lord. Not all of them are in the Lord. Greet the ones in the household who are in the Lord. So Narcissus, again, is not identified as a believer, but there were believers in his household. Now, who is Narcissus? Well, uh, William Barclay, William Barclay has done a little bit of looking into, and he suggests that in Greece, that the Lightfoot, who holds the same view in the household of Narcissus can be, can be defined in this way. Narcissus is a common name, but the most famous Narcissus was a freeman who was secretary to the Imperial Claudius. Claudius, And, um, and he exercised a tremendous influence over the, Imperial, over the emperor. Um, in fact, he is said to have amassed a great fortune of an est uh, est estimable wealth estimatable wealth. So he had a lot of money and, uh, and he gained a lot of money for uh, 4 million pounds actually for um, the Imperial, Imperial uh, Emperor Claudius. And so that is amazing. Emperor Claudius, he made Claudius more wealthy, but he, but he had a tremendous amount of wealth. His power had lain in the fact that all correspondence addressed in the emperor had to pass through his hands and never reached the emperor until he allowed it to do so. And so he had a great job, a great duty. Verse 12. Um, greet Trafina, Trafina, 
in Trifosa, um, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Perseus, Perseus, who labored much in the Lord. So they mean delicate and, and dainty, um, Trifinia and Trifosis, Trifosa, Trifosa, who labored in the Lord. And what he is using there is a strong word for the for labor, to labor. Again, it's copia word. And what, what he's saying is maybe a little play on the words, you may be dainty and delicate, but you sure work hard for the Lord. Trifiana, Trifiana, and Trifosa. We don't know anything about them except they labored in the Lord. A lot of these people, we don't know anything about them, but all we know is they labored in the Lord. And uh, and then he mentions Persis. Uh, uh, Pers it, Persis. Yeah, Persis. Another female name, okay? In fact, it literally means a Persian. A Persian woman. This is a Persian woman. So this is a Gentile. In the Church of Rome, in the Church of Rome, there was a Persian woman who loved Christ. So we don't know how he met her, but she labored much in the Lord. Now you say, was she better than Trifinia and Trifosa? I don't know. We don't know that. We can't determine that. God keeps the records, and I'm sure there are some saints who will come, uh, who will commend for be commended for laboring and some who will be commended for laboring much. Uh, would you agree with that? Your works. And it may well be that she was older. It is interesting that Trifinia and Trifosa presented uh, present present tense who are laboring in the Lord and the beloved persons who labored past tense in the Lord again and ident ident identification uh, that uh, Trifini and, Tro and, and Trifosa may have been young, but Persis much older because it gives her past tense, but it gives the other two present tense. And so that means she much, she probably was older than them. And so she labored much perhaps because she was much older than them. And so verse 13, <clears throat> Greek uh, Rufus chosen the Lord and his mother and mine. So Greek Rufus. So now he's the only one of whom that is said that some have suggested he was the only Calvinist in the Church of Rome. Now, I'm sure we can make that conclusion, but I'm not sure, in fact, that we can even conclude that this is to say his choosing in terms of salvation. All Christians are chosen in the Lord. It may well be that he's just focusing on that. He's identifying him just for the sake of bearing his pace. And so... So Rufus, he knows, he loves him. He loves, he knows Rufus. He loves Rufus. He says Rufus is chosen in the Lord. It probably means more than just his salvation, okay? It probably has the idea that he has chosen a unique way for service to Christ. And then he says, greet also his mother and mine. You say, wait a minute, is this Paul's brother? No, no, this is not literally his mother. That's, this is church mother. I have church mothers. I have church mother, Mother Jones. That's my church mother. So, but what uh, Paul is saying is the mother of Rufus was to me on some occasions a mother indeed or a, a mother indeed. So this is like Paul's mother spiritually. Okay, we don't know anything about Paul's mother, but there were, but here was a woman who became in a personal, loving way like a mother to Paul. And so then we jump into verse fourteen. Greet. Asyncritus uh, and Philgun and Hermas and Petrobus and Hermas and the brethren who are with them. So greet them. Now, what this is, what this says is here is we have five men who had a church in a home. Okay, again, like Priscilla and Aquila, people opened their homes then to have service in the church, in, in, to have church within their homes. So the church would come into their homes and have a good time in the Lord. And he says, say hi to those guys out there, those five who are leaders of assembly uh, within the whole Roman church. So say hi to Rufus, say hi to all these guys. Here, he's probably pointing out some leaders, some elders who are pastoring or shepherding one group of Christians in Rome. As I said, they met in many ways and we don't know anything about any of them, but they met in different ways. And um, some ways had to be hidden because of the danger that they will come about or come in contact with if they were to have it openly. And so they had to have church within other people's homes and other places that was pretty 
um, secretive. And so that's very important to know that we have liberty here in the United States. We can have church anywhere we want to have church and we can have church um, in the open and outdoors. It doesn't matter. We can have church, praise the Lord, anywhere. And that is amazing. Uh, verse 15, greet uh, Philogos and Julia, Nereus and his sister, Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. So greet these people. Say hi to them. They were little branch fellowships. And he says, greet all the rest of these folks, uh, men, women, greet all of them. Greet all of them. Now, just for a moment on Nereus, as we draw this to a conclusion, who is Nereus? William Barclay again says in AD 95, there happened uh, an event which, which shocked Rome. Two of the most distinguished people in Rome were condemned for being Christians. They were husband and wife. The husband was Flavius Clemens, and he was the consul of Rome. And uh, the wife was Domitia, we talked about her earlier, and she was of royal blood. She was the granddaughter of Bas Vespasian, Vespasian, that Vespasian, Vespasian, a former emperor and the niece of Domitian, um, the reigning emperor in, in 95 AD. In fact, the two sons of Flavius Clemens and Domitia had been designated uh, Domitian's su successors in the emperor power. Flavius was executed and Domitia was banished to the island of Ponteia. Now, were years after Paula said uh, saw the cave and uh, where she drew out a long martyrdom for the Christian name. And now the point, the name of the treasurer of Flavius and Domitia was Nereus. It, it, is it possible, says Barclay, uh, that Nereus the slave had something to do with the making unto Christians of Flavius Clemens and ex-consul Domitia, the princes of the raw blood. Perhaps, just perhaps, Greet Nereus and his sister and Olympias and all the saints who are with them. So just greet them. Just greet them. They labored in the Lord. They did amazing works for the Lord. They went out of their way for the Lord. They put their life on the line for the Lord. Verse 16, our last verse, and then we will have continuation next Wednesday. And verse 17 um, through 27. Verse 16 says, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. This is how we greet with a holy kiss. This is how we're supposed to greet with a, uh, a, a holy, uh, a holy, godly hug and kiss. This is how we greet within the church. The church should greet like this. And then the end of the session, greet everybody with a, with a what? A holy kiss. Greet everybody in a customary mode of church and all the churches of Christ greet you. Now we're going to stop at this point, but may I suggest to you that you're probably feeling in your heart what I felt that all of a sudden that the early church has come to life and it lives and breathes just like our church does today. And that's what it does. And we're not so far away from it, are we? Uh, we could as well describe ourselves here. Some of us who are laboring in the Lord, others labored much in the Lord. Those who have endured hardships, those who are willing to give their lives for the Lord, those who are beloved and well-beloved, those who have been used by God to reach others for Christ. And these are just people, Paul, and Paul knows them and he loves them. And if he could, he would kiss him. He would kiss them. He would kiss them if he could, but he's not. He's in prison. So this is Paul. This is his family. This is intimacy. This man knew what it was to stand for the truth, but he also knew what it was to love God's people. And that's the mark of uniqueness of his wonderful character. That's how Paul was. He loved everybody and he loved God's people. Mostly he loved God's people and he labored and he labored for them. And, um, and he knew that his reward was in heaven. But he said, it's better for me to be here with you, that I can teach you and for as long as I can. I can guide you and urge you and I can show you. And that's why he said, follow me while I follow Christ. And Paul, and Apostle Paul is a true, he is a true servant of God. And, and that's why the true example that we should follow, the Gentiles should follow. We all should follow Paul to be a believer, whether Jew or Gentile. Follow Christ. Follow, he said, follow me while I follow Christ. And so... Follow Paul and um, how he greeted and how he loved, had love for the saints, love for the church. And that's how we should be today. Not fighting and bickering within the church. That will happen at times. However, we are to love one another and get along with one another and persevere with one another and edify 
one another. Love you so much. Join us again uh, on Friday for the pastoral moment so you can be encouraged and enlightened with the word of God. And on Sunday, tune in for the message of God. And then back on Wednesday, we'll complete chapter 16. The Paul lean epistles will complete Romans. And then we'll move on to the next epistle. epistle. So your homework for this time and next time, think about Think about what is the next epistle that Paul wrote after Romans in order. And we got it. You got to know the order. You got to look at the dates. And so please uh, put that down in the comment box. I love you. I thank you. God bless you. We're here at True Vine. We love you. Thank you for all your support. Until next time, we are the Church of Love. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and join our online Christian family. Tithes, offerings, and donations can be made via Cash App at dollar sign TVMBC or by mail at True Vine Missionary Baptist Church, 1407 Grove Street, Houston, Texas, 77020. Thank you so much and have a blessed day.